Ohio State, Michigan, the Once Upon a Saturday Tour will be in the big house this Saturday. It's going to be, Jesse tells me, why am I leaning on Jesse for meteorological insight? 38 degrees and cloudy at kickoff. A non-zero percent chance of precipitation, 100 percent chance of toxicity and just utter hatred. It's a beautiful thing. It's what makes this sport great. Meemaw, one of the very few areas that she, I think, was a little misguided in is she, she told me hate will get you nowhere. And Meemaw never went to the game. And that's all I'm going to say about that. This is a big noon kickoff. It is 12 Eastern, and you can fill in the rest wherever you live. The stakes are as high on this game as I can ever remember in any regular season college football game. Just unbelievable. If you have a if you have an NFL fan in your life that kind of dabbles in college, but they can't really dive in, or if you have maybe a fiance or a significant other, someone that you want to introduce to our sport, cash in as many favors as you need to, get them in front of a TV this Saturday, because this will be unbelievable. Have you listened to Jim Harbaugh talk this week? Have you listened to Ryan Day talk? Guys, most of the time, coaches are just willing to lie and at least say they respect the opponents they hate and don't respect. They won't even lie this week. It's awesome. It's wonderful because I am a winner no matter what. I just get to stand there on the field and watch it. Both of these teams are as healthy, as far as we can tell, as they've been pretty much all year. Travion Henderson looks as good as he's looked. Uh, You know, Blake Corum did not play in this game last year. He suited up. I stood there and watched him warm up. He played like one or two plays, and then he was done. We get both of those guys, barring something in practice this week. We get both of those guys. It looks like at full strength this week. So, a million different angles we can go here. I remember being at this game last year. I remember so vividly, I told you guys the story. We went to, I think I ended up going to uh, both press conferences, I think I did. So after the game, we come back down the tunnel. Uh, Uncle Dennis and I were there, and we did some post-game work for CBS. Ohio State had just lost the game. And some of the seniors on the Ohio State team came out of the locker room after they had been dismissed. You know, you're supposed to go back to your dorm, go home. Well, a lot of them were never going to play in that stadium again. And so they kind of trickled back down the tunnel, sat up in the stands, and think about this. This, was, this sucked for us. We're doing our live hit, and you got, you got players scattered throughout the end zone, some of them sitting on the turf, some of them sitting on the third or fourth row of the stands, just bawling their eyes out. Never forget that. And I remember thinking to myself, walking out of the building, explosive plays just completely decided this game. Michigan last year had 530 yards on Ohio State, and 382 of them came on six plays. And you saw the game as well as I did, and it's so easy to say, oh, if they just limit the big plays, it's a totally different game. But they didn't. Like, that's a football game. That's kind of like saying, well, if we didn't turn the ball over, we, or, or we should have this, or we should have that. Yeah, but you didn't. If you should have, you would have. This is how the game actually works. So they didn't limit them last year. Well, we fast forward a year, and all that changes is the venue, really. And I ask myself, The same thing. I ask, what happens if Ohio State limits the explosive plays? And I also ask, can they limit explosive plays? I was at Michigan-Penn State a couple of weeks ago. If you remember that game, Penn State got really good edge pressure early on Michigan, and then Michigan adjusted to their offensive credit, and they just ran the ball on Penn State the rest of the day. I mean, they ran it and ran it and ran it on Penn State the rest of the day. I The first thing I wonder about this is, Um, independent of the pressure, Ohio State, JTT could have his breakout game. Yeah, they could get pressure on JJ, but independent of that, I just wonder if Michigan really is dead set on running the ball down Ohio State's throat. I wonder if they can. I wonder how much success they have there. Because it wasn't a classical run the ball down your throat situation last year. It was rip a few explosive plays and otherwise don't have a ton of big success in the run game, but the stat sheet looks like we did if you look at the yards per carry. Well, if we limit the explosive plays and then on the other side, just hold serve at the line of scrimmage and you force J.J. McCarthy to beat you with his arm, can he? And how many points does Michigan need? Because they got uh, one of the saltiest defenses in the country as well. These are the kinds of things that I think will ultimately decide this game, but it's a Jim Knowles game. Out of all the people who are integral parts of what the outcome will be Saturday, one of them's not even on the field. Like, I think Jim Knowles, for all the talk about Harbaugh not being on the field, Jim Knowles, that defensive coordinator that Ryan Day brought in and had him last year, and now I think fully has him ingrained and and all those players playing with kind of his thumbprint collectively on that defense, 
I think it's the best interior defensive line that Michigan's faced all year. And so I wonder what kind of success they have running the ball. I wonder, uh, in other words, if it doesn't work out and if you see Michigan get, kind of getting stoned at the line of scrimmage early, is J.J. McCarthy able to make plays with his arm? Because that's the next very important point in this game that I don't think it takes an expert to figure out is you hadn't seen McCarthy with a touchdown pass the last three games. It's, I don't think it's that easy to figure out. Like, I've watched that dude play several years now. I know he's more effective than that recent stat line were to indicate. Against Penn State, they flat out didn't need to do it. Last week, I could reasonably explain that away as letdown spot, look-ahead spot, uh, defense and special teams carried the day. Maybe it's just an off game. Individually, like, you can explain that stuff away, but if I'm right... If that stuff's explainable, and this is the game J.J. McCarthy um, shows up in, or if he's the kind of player that shows up in big games, obviously this is the game he shows up in. And then the next point that I think about is, what does J.J. McCarthy winning the game for Michigan look like? If McCord wins the game for Ohio State, he just won the game throwing the ball. If J.J. wins it, he may end up putting up 83 yards rushing, and 195 yards through the air, but they're really good on third down. They're really good and opportunistic in the red zone, and their defense helps them out, and they play a complementary style, which Michigan's done all year. Like, that's the kind of game it could look like. But no passing touchdowns the last three weeks. I've watched it. It just feels off. I don't know what it is. It just feels off. Kyle McCord, the biggest, the biggest concern I have with him in talking about the comparison with the quarterbacks is – consistency. I think an Ohio State fan would tell you the same thing, and I know they would because I have a group text going with some of them on the uh, iJosh right now. I think that if you were to get his best game, you feel pretty confident. Travion Henderson's back full strength. You feel pretty confident, uh, but that's an if. You know, if you were to get that. Well, no one knows that. You know, and you're also trotting a guy out to start for the first time in this game, whereas Michigan's got the luxury of their guy having already played in this game. Ohio State also is 114th in turnovers forced this year, Michigan fourth in turnovers lost. So turnovers are random. I will grant you that. But if you're, if you're trying to bank on the fact that you win those sort of intangible or unpredictable stat categories, uh, mathematically, it wouldn't appear that the odds are overwhelmingly in Ohio State's favor. And look, Michigan is so player-led, veteran, senior-laden, it's just not the kind of team that's handing you a game. You have got to go in there and you got to beat them. Now, I think Ohio State's got a team that can do it. So it's not the end of the world if you're neutral in turnover margin, if you don't score on special teams, if you don't block a punt, as long as you limit them from doing it the same way. I think the number two position at cornerback for both of these teams is really interesting. It, when, you, when you gauge other coaches – they kind of seem to talk about, uh, at least in the Big Ten, they kind of talk about the two-corner position for both of these teams. And if you have the personnel, there are plays to be made there. If that's the case, um, all due respect to Roman Wilson and Cornelius Johnson, who was big in this game last year, by the way, I look at the potential of Marvin Harrison and Emeka Buka, uh, and you mix in tight ends on both sides of that equation as well. I like Ohio State's opportunity. Again, if you have consistency, if you have time to throw the ball, which falls back on that offensive line, if you have all those things, Ohio State can make a ton of plays through the air. Theoretically, could do that. The players are there, in other words. There's always talk about hype going into these games. There's always talk about mentality and edge. And um, to me, it's more about sustainability because it is, it is one of the easiest things in the world to get yourself up to play this game. It is infinitely harder to think back two years ago, for example, when you could feel Michigan start to take the game over, when you realized that Michigan was actually there and competitively and physically they were going to match you and maybe exceed you, Ohio State folded and, and Michigan flexed on them. Michigan started leaning and Ohio State crumbled. Now that's two years ago. Last year, I didn't feel like Ohio State crumbled at all. I thought they matched them. I just thought explosive plays went Michigan's way. They executed when Ohio State didn't. That's the way the game was decided. My point is leading up to this. How do you sustain that intensity? Uh, you're, you will get hit and you will land hits. How do you sustain it? I felt like all the way back in spring and then going into media days and whatnot, uh, being around Ohio State a little bit, my biggest question with them was now that you tasted your own blood twice and you realize why that game is being lost, you, you tried to go one way, they countered another way, their ways had the edge, 
and you try and adopt and harden portions of your own infrastructure to match that, are you there? I felt like going into this year, they would be there. But ultimately, we got to wait for the game to be played on Saturday. So, Colin, let's take a look at what the model thinks. Uh, currently at FanDuel, Michigan is minus 3.5. The total is 45.5, so a lower scoring game is expected. Our model's a little bit shorter there. We've got Michigan minus 2. I, in the preseason, uh, predicted Ohio State to win the Big Ten because I felt like there was an edge on that team that even if both teams were healthy and with the team or with the game being in, in Ann Arbor late in the year, I felt like they had addressed the necessary compartments of their team that lacked the last two years. And I thought they got really intentional, really after the Michigan and Georgia losses last year, about evolving in the areas they needed to evolve in. Didn't feel like they were a long way off. There was never a big gap or anything like that. I felt like they did that. Nothing has brought me off that this year. So this is a highly competitive game. It's, it's coin flip, 55-45 either way. But I've seen nothing to back me off that opinion. And so I'm going Ohio State to win. And therefore, I'm also going Ohio State to cover. I uh, wouldn't be shocked if the outcome went either way. But later in the show, we'll talk about what happens if this goes either way. If Michigan wins it, if Ohio State wins it, what happens with the loser? I just want you guys in the immediacy to think about this. As I said, if you've got someone who has never really been into college football, lay out the stakes for them here. I know you got to be a fan to fully understand how big this is, but you've got a team in Michigan that all season long you've had in your mind parked in the number one, number two, maybe number three spot. And lately it's been number one or number two. And most playoff projections I've seen have Michigan penciled into the playoff. Therefore, they win the Big Ten Championship because they won this game, theoretically. And over the span of four quarters Saturday, that could all evaporate. That They are out of the Big Ten picture. They're probably out of the playoff picture. All of their preseason goals are out the window. You look at a guy like J.J. McCarthy, you look at a lot of these seniors and, and these upperclassmen that still leave Michigan having never won a playoff game. That stuff changes over one afternoon if they lose, if they win. If Michigan wins, I don't, I, I don't really know that I can put into proper context how toxic the, the narrative will be that forms around Ryan Day. It's already there. I'm not talking about from rival fans either. I'm talking about his own fan base. If your guy loses a third straight to Michigan, and this time against their backup head coach, I think you understand where that's going. I'm not, I'm not sitting here telling you I agree with it. I'm just saying it's reality, and sometimes my opinion is not held by the masses. I think you know where that's going. This is a very unique game because it is its own season. Even though they designated just seven days for the game to happen, it is its own season. It's its own little ecosystem, and it's amazing to witness. And we're going to be there for the third year in a row. By the slimmest of margins, I'm going with Ohio State to win the game, and Ohio State, therefore, to cover as a short underdog. Nevertheless, whoever wins the game, we will have the shirt available in the Pate State store, patestatematerial.com. Uh, for about the next four days, because the game doesn't happen until Saturday, and then it will disappear. And so there it is, Michigan Stadium, the big house, this Saturday. Memorable, very memorable, no matter the outcome.